Good morning. Uh, my name is Patrick Allen, and I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress. And the project uh, is conducted in the Cincinnati, southwestern Ohio area through the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And in charge of that project in Cincinnati is Brian Powers. And today, uh, my wife Mary is our camera person on this video. And we have the pleasure of interviewing <coughs> on today, which happens to be November the 11th, Veterans Day, a veteran of World War II, John Becker. Thank you for doing this interview, sir. Happy. Do you go happy by? To do it. Do you go by John, or do you have John. another? John. Okay. Uh, John, tell us, uh, you know, what's your full name? John Gregory Becker. Where were you born and when? Born in Kilmer, Iowa, at home <laughs> at uh, 12, 16, 1924. And what were your mother and your father's names? My father's name was Rudolph J. Becker, and we've not been able to find anywhere to explain the J. My mother was Philomena Meyer Becker. Meyer was her Meyer was her maiden name? Meyer was her maiden name. M E Y E R, correct? M E Y E R. Yeah. Now can you can you see this? These are photos of your mother and father, correct? Yes. And uh, on this document, it shows that your dad was born February 12, 1984, in Ossian, O-S-S-I-A-N, Iowa. Yes. Yeah. And your uh, mother, Philomena, was born July 3rd, 1989, so she was about five years uh, younger than your dad, and she was born in Kalmar, C-A-L-M-A-R, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. 18. 1889. Uh, and dad died in May 12, 1958. And your mom died March 3, 1976. Correct? Correct. Great. And here are pictures of other members of your family. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yes, down a little. Good. That's and then that's seven members of my family. There are four others. These were the seven in the service in World War II. At the uh, top we have Lawrence Lawrence Becker. He was in the army, correct? Yes. And uh, where did he serve? All over Europe, he was he pretty much a chauffeur for a, a full colonel. And we have in his biography, shows a map of all the places they went. He, uh, he covered most of Europe. And, and below that, to the, to the right, is Robert J. Becker. He was in the Air Force. Where yeah. did he serve? He served in Burma. He was in the first squadron into from Burma into China, as I understand. And uh, somewhere in my papers there shows the award he was given, uh, China's highest award for was, their work. Was he a pilot? He was a pilot, squadron leader. What did he fly? P. 40 and a P-51. Okay, the P-40 was the old Warhawk, wasn't it? Yes. And the P-51 was the Mustang. I'm mistaken on the 51. Uh, two planes, the, the P-40 for sure, I've forgotten the other one. All right. And over to the left is Howard W. Becker, and he was in the Army. Where did he serve? He served in Europe and was 
active uh, in the invasion of D-Day. Uh, he was a motor mechanic, had most to do with trucks and keeping them going and all. All right. And below Lawrence is a photo of Virginia M. Becker. And she was, in the, she was a Navy nurse? Virginia served in Pearl Harbor, not at the time of the attack. Um, she was active over there for most of her Navy career. So she was a lieutenant commander? Lieutenant commander. Oh, great. And uh, below her and to her right is Willis J. Becker. He was, he was in the Army? Yes, he was in the Army, served in um, New Zealand, and was in the hospital corps. Uh, he was on Saipan, I don't think active duty though. I'm not, I, I'm not sure on that. And over to the left of Virginia is Charles T. Becker in the Army Air Corps. Charles it uh, served in Italy and was there at the same time I was. Uh, he was being shipped home out of Naples port and I was at the port at that time and we got together for a couple of days. Oh, good, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now he was in the Air Corps, was he a pilot or was he on the ground? He was a pilot and flew the P-51. Did he ever talk about any of his combat experiences? He did not. Okay. And uh, between them and right below Virginia is John G. Becker. That looks like a familiar face. <laughs> and that's you, and you're in the Merchant Marines. I was in the Merchant Marine. Great. From and over to 43 to 46. And then you were in the Coast Guard. From 50. 51 to 53. Great. And at the bottom left is Ginger. Tell me about Ginger. She's Ginger an Army was Guard our, dog. Our family dog, and he was a very friendly, sort of a neighborhood dog, great dog. But they took him two years. Little story, we had a, when, she, when the dog came home, I was playing with the little girl next door and like you do with a youngster, I took her up and threw her up in the air, not in the air, but up like that. And boy, that dog hit me in the wrist so fast. Didn't break the skin, but he uh -huh. let me know that wasn't what to do. <laughs> And, it, and did all these uh, family members who were in the service, they all survived their, their duties? They all survived, and fortunately nobody injured. We were, a, we were a very blessed family. Great, great. Well, thank you for letting me talk about those folks, and we'll get that uh, part of our little interview taken care of. Now, uh, you were born at home, and where was the family living uh, at that time? What town? We were living in Kelmer, Iowa. I was born in 24. In 1929, my father had been done, doing extremely well in property acquisitions and like a lot of people at that time was wealthy on paper. And uh, in 29, he lost everything, including his health. He went to the hospital for almost a year. Uh, my mother picked us up, and we went to Dubuque, Iowa, and uh, lived there. And how did we, <laughs> I don't, we knew we didn't have much money, but I don't ever remember going hungry. Okay. My father was from a family of 11. 
One aunt was extremely wealthy, another was quite well to do it. I, I don't know this, but I assume that's where a lot of the money came during the Depression. W were those two people affected by the stock market plunge in 29? <sighs> Not seriously, it, it, nothing uh, was apparent. Okay. So when, when you were born, uh, did you have any uh, brothers and sisters already in the family? I had, let's see, <laughs> I had, I was the eighth one. You were the eighth child? Yes, I had the eighth, yeah. and the youngest boy, boy, and then nine, ten, and eleven were, were girls. <laughs> oh, wow. Big family. My mother was an only child. Boy, she uh, she had quite an awakening then, going from <laughs> yeah. one one child family to eleven children. My wife's an only child. Well, t tell me about uh, your dad was in the hospital for about a year. Uh, How did your family uh, get by just with your mom? I'm assuming, as I mentioned, that his his brothers and sisters helped out. Helped out. That's the only thing, and I know nothing for a fact. We, uh, I don't ever remember going hungry. Did you ever have all children living in the house at the same time? No. What, what was the maximum number of kids that uh, were living in the same house? Let me subtract first, if I could. Uh, my oldest brother, Lawrence, went to CCC. Uh, my second brother, Bob, went away to college. Don't ask me how. Um, Virginia went up to live with this very wealthy aunt, and that's when she went to nursing school. So uh, probably eight was the most that we ever had at home. Uh, how about uh sleeping accommodations. How many children were in uh, the same bedroom with you? Three other boys. Three other boys? Four of you in the, in the bedroom? Yes. Did you have bunk beds or what did you have? We had two big beds, two in each. Okay. The girls were the same way. What kind of a house did you have? With two story, one story? Two story home. Uh, did you have, uh, in Iowa, did you have running water at that time? <laughs> we did indeed. We had running water, indoor plumbing. Uh, the only thing that was a real fall back in the refrigerator or the ice box was on the back porch. And I still remember the ice man bringing in 25 or 50 pounds and throw it over his back. That was delivered as was our milk. Now I've, I've seen little cards about oh, six or eight by eight, and they had numbers on there, 25, 50, 75, to tell the ice man how much ice you wanted. Did you have one of those? We did. Put that in the window for the ice man? Right. And how was the house heated? Coal. And uh, how was that delivered? delivered, the truck would back up towards the house. There was a special window with a ramp, not a, well, sort of a ramp, and the coal would just be poured on that and it would go down into what they called the coal bin. And you had and a the, basement? Yes. A furnace was in the basement? Yes. And when you uh, put the coal into the uh, furnace, uh, did you have to shovel it in, or was there an auger of some type that took it in? Ours required taking the shovel and putting it in. Was that one of your chores at some time in your youth? <laughs> when I got a little older, sure, could lift the shovel with the with the coal in it. Sure. Um, where did you start school? What what town? In Dubuque, Iowa. What was the school that you started in? St. Column Kills Catholic School. 
Um, I missed kindergarten. I started in first grade and went up through, graduated from uh, 12th grade in the same building. Well, after your father lost everything in the, in the Depression, uh, what kind of work did he engage in to try to support himself and your family? He uh, went into the real estate business, established an office in, in Dubuque, in Dubuque. Uh, and he did never achieve the level that he was at previously. His uh, Probably the biggest contract he ever had was when John Deere established a factory in Dubuque and he acquired all the property for that plant. All right. Now, with so many children, I imagine your mother never worked outside the home. She did not. Um, she was a... Did you, did you finish uh, school at, say, Column Kill? Did you finish grade school there? Yes, grade school, high school. They had a high school also? Yes. Okay, when did you graduate high school? 1943. While you were in high school or even in grade school, did you uh, have any jobs where you worked to earn money to help the family? <laughs> I don't remember ever not having a job. Tell me about I, I, <laughs> tell me about some of the jobs you did as a child. I, I cut lots of grass. I shoveled lots of snow. And my dentist, Dr. Connolly, had me do his lawn, his windows, and any other odd jobs. And in exchange, he did all my dental work. Okay. So I obviously got the, the best part of that arrangement. He was a fine man. Super. Uh after high school, after graduated high school, uh, oh, by the way, how many kids, how many kids graduated with you? Forty-three. And did uh, you go into the service after high school? Yes. Did, were you drafted or did you enlist? I, I, you know, Pat, I can't remember, and I've tried to find evidence. My only thing is. I know, I remember going, and the doctor kept looking at this right eye, and I had a little flutter or something, and I think I looked so young, he must have felt sorry for me, and I was uh, classified 4F. Which means that you weren't eligible. Yes. All right, but you eventually you got into service. I. Uh, Shortly after, I hitchhiked over to Chicago and I uh, joined the Maritime Service. Well, did they run you through another physical? Huh. Pat, I'm sorry I can't answer the question. Wh wh I don't remember, but I sure didn't have any trouble. I I just went right, I went home again and got ready and they went off to New York to Sheep Shed, Sheep Shed Bay. Well, why, why did you uh, choose the Maritime Service as opposed to one other branch? It's the only option I had that would ha accept me with the 4F okay. classification. Now, did you have uh, other brothers and sisters at that time that were in service? I think all of them, possibly with the exception of Lawrence, my oldest brother, were in the service at that time. Some of them went in in 41, a couple in 43, Chaz. Um, I think other than Lawrence, they were all in at that time. Well, in 1944, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, uh, you, you, you would have been uh, almost a, a teenager. <laughs> I was a teenager, yeah. indeed. Do, do you remember 
learning that the uh, Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor? Very vividly. Well, uh, do you remember where you were or what you thought about that? I was at home on the front porch and my mother called us in the house. And then uh, the next thing, remembering Franklin D. Roosevelt making his famous speech. All right. Uh, where was your dad at that time? Uh, was he in the office or was he home? He was in the office. Did he, when he came home, did he talk about it at all? I can't, I, I do not remember that. All right, so you go to Chicago and uh, you enlist in the Merchant Marines. Uh, after you enlisted, uh, did you come home to get ready? Yes. And how long were you home before you had to report uh, to some uh, other location? I think it was only a couple of weeks. What did your mom and dad think about you joining the Merchant Marines? I think they were, had no objection. But that, at that time, uh, patriotism was pretty high, wasn't it? I repeat, please, Pat. At that time, patriotism was pretty high, and a lot of people were, a lot of young men and, and young women were uh, entering the service, weren't they? Extremely high. And it was, I don't know, to be classified 4F was uh, really kind of difficult at that time. You kind of kind of depressed, I, uh, were you? Yes, and uh, <laughs> there was an attitude, obviously not by the people like myself that were 4F, but the people that were leaving and going in the service. I, I don't know if they resented or not. I think it was more a self-consciousness about the classification. Pretty much that you weren't able to compete with your fellow students your age. Well, uh, you, you had uh, uh, relatively large, for that time, senior class in high school. What was the mix in high school? <coughs> half and half boys and girls, or was there more boys or more girls in your senior class? Thinking back, almost a split. And certainly not an exact split, but what it was, it was, it was there were no dominant uh, boys or girls. Did a lot of your did a lot of your male classmates uh, join one of the services? I think practically, I can't remember anybody that wasn't in the service. And one of my close friends, Calvin Waltz probably one of the most gentle people in the whole class ended up getting uh, killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Oh wow, so he was in the Army? Yes. Infantry? I don't know that. Um, was he your best buddy in, uh, in high school? Very close friend. Uh-huh. Um, Did he, did he join the service about the same time you did or because he was not classified 4F, did he get in right away? I don't know that. Okay. Where did you have to report? After you come home for two weeks and you get ready to report, where did you go? I went to New York and then out to Sheepshead Bay. New York City and on to Sheepshead? Yes. And what, what did you do? What was the name of the station there? Sheepshead Bay, it went maritime service. Okay. Um, what did you do there at Sheepshead Bay? What kind of training did you go through? Uh, I, I particularly remember going out in the, in the boats in the cold, cold weather. Uh, I remember swimming and jumping off the 10-foot platform and uh, 
a lot of, we would go up in a sail loft and do a lot of seamanship, a lot of knots. Uh, it was a pretty complete nautical training. Uh, had you, did you know how to swim before you joined? I did. And when, you, when you're jumping in the water, you're talking about jumping in the bay? No, jumping in the pool. Pool, okay. Did you, have, uh, did you have training where you were out in the water that you jumped off the ship? No. Okay. That water was so cold. So what, what was your classification when you joined the Merchant Marines? I had a seaman first, seaman, plain old seaman, seaman. no classification. Till later on, I got a seaman second class. How long were you a, a seaman? All of, I think four months. How long were you a chief's head? All four months? Yes. And you, you gave me a, a, a listing of your service. And uh, in March of 44, uh, you were in TC Marine Officers Cadet School in St. Petersburg. That is correct. Is that where you went after Sheep's Head? Yes. How long were you at uh, the cadet school? Three months. What did you do there? Concentrated primarily in navigation. Was that book or actual training on a ship? Both. We went out on a ship quite often. What kind of ship? It was probably a hundred foot I don't know the classification. How was it powered? Probably diesel. It wasn't just a sailboat? No. All right, after you left uh, St. Petersburg, it shows you went to New Orleans, Louisiana? Yes. Again, more schooling? Yes. Um, how long were you there in New Orleans? Almost a year. Uh, it's just uh, longer than any of us wanted to be. <laughs> well, some of the time was schooling, but more of it was just plain waiting. Well, a after you had that schooling, then you go to Vessel Manning Pool? Yes. Now, what was that? That was just where we waited. We lived, I lived with three other uh, men that I went in school with, and we just waited to be assigned. What, what kind of accommodations did you have? All four of you in one room? No, we rented uh, an apartment. Okay. And where did you get your meals? One of the officer's wife lived with us and she did, they handled the money and the food. All right, you didn't have to eat on, eat at the base or anything? No. Uh, you were a junior Marine officer at that time? Yes. When did you become a junior Marine officer? After leaving St. Pete's, the, uh, working for the Army Transport Service with their authority. We served as deck officers even though we had no license to do so. The limitation was on the tonnage of the ships we were on. What did a deck officer do? When we finally were assigned to a ship as a junior officer, I had the 12 to 4 watch on the ship we were, when we were underway. All right, when, when was it that you finally got underway after all this schooling? <sighs> we went to Naples 
and I was assigned to a seagoing tug for a month and then assigned to a second one of uh, same size ship for about a year and in that the biggest operation was going to Iran, North Africa where the war was pretty well over. We were hauling out all as much equipment as we could take. We towed, I think we had three barges we were towing full of equipment, taking it back to Naples and en route we hit a rather vigorous storm and lost the, the whole tow. And even with the help of planes and other ships, we never did find. Lost all the equipment on the three barges? Yes. Uh, and the barge. <laughs> well, uh, f from March 1 of 45 to March 27 of 45, you say you were en route to the Mediterranean Theater of Operations as a third officer. When did you become a third officer? <clears throat> An active one when I got to Naples. <clears throat> I was, I guess you'd say, awarded the third officer after we finished in St. Pete. Now, was that just a matter of uh, your education and training, or was that a, just a matter of the time you had been in service, or did you do something special to be made a third officer? I would, I, <laughs> I hope it showed some error some level of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, uh, you spent about three days as a seaman's, in the Seaman's Reserve Pool, uh, and it says M-T-O-U-S-A. What was that? That was uh, out of New Orleans. Uh, out of New Orleans. Okay. That must have been, this was, there was nothing for me to do, so I signed on, not as a wheelsman, on a ship that went from New Orleans up to New York. Now, what does a wheelsman do? Take orders from the mate on, in charge as to what he wants on the compass as as to direction. So are, are you actually guiding the ship or you're just giving directions to the person guiding the ship? I, I'm actually like driving the car. All right, <laughs> all right. And <clears throat> what, what kind of a ship were you using at that time? That was a victory, a victory ship. Uh -huh. and my only claim to claim on the probably my only claim to fame when we came into New York, someone ashore from the, the, the uh, harbor master flashed the light, doot, 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 and nobody could read him. And I said, I was on the wheel at the time, and I said, I can read that. And that was part of our training in St. Pete. Uh -huh. And it said, what ship? So I got on the thing and boop, 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 answered him, what ship? Uh -huh. <laughs> that was my <laughs> big moment. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, when, did you, uh, when did you finally get uh, underway to go over to uh, North Africa? That was really one of our first trips when we got into Naples. And then when, when, when was that? What, are we in 1944, 1945? Huh, let's, let me be, I think 45, because I was there from 45 to 46. All right. For about a year. Well, let's uh, let's go back a little bit to uh, you're towing these three barges and you get hit by this real big storm and you lose your, your barges and the load. 
Uh, was your ship able to uh, make it on to Naples? Yes, we made it very, very well. And um, what happened when you got to Naples and you don't have any uh, materials you're towing? What, what was the result of that? I'm not aware of what the disposition was. I'm sure the captain was called up to answer. Uh huh. So what did you do when you got to Naples yourself? What did you do? I stayed on the ship and made lots of other trips in the Mediterranean and in the Adriatic. And where, where were some of those trips to and what was the nature of those trips? Our biggest area that we covered was up in Leghorn, and in, in Italian the name is different, but we called it Leghorn, Italy. And going in the harbor, just there were ships sunk all the way in there, just enough to get in and find a place to dock. Were those Allied ships? Were those our ships? Or were they German I ships? I don't know whose they were. And uh, the town itself was equally, I have a couple of pictures of Leghorn, was just bombed tremendously. Had that Every been... place you walked, it was. But they had, by then they had cleared, you know, so you could walk and the army trucks were going around. But had that been a uh, significant German port, do you know, for, for ships or submarines? I really don't know. But uh, the, the town itself was pretty devastated by a bombing. Funny, you should ask. Yes, it was. I, <laughs> I had occasion to talk with some German prisoners. They were locked up. But the German prisoners, well, can you talk German? No. Can you talk French? No. Can you Italian? Well, very, very little. But they could speak so many languages. Oh, really? Like many of us, uh, we didn't, we knew English. So what, I, what, what was the occasion when you met with those German prisoners? Why did you see them? I can't answer it. I don't know. Okay. Um, do you know what, had they been uh, Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, veterans for Germany? Do you know which? I do not. Where were they when you saw them? Were they in a camp or were they? They were in a camp. Why were you in the camp? Well, I think just visiting, we often go to the army camps to uh, get a vehicle to use to get around. Uh, what kind of, did you, were you, did you drive some of those vehicles? Yes. What, what were they, jeeps or other jeeps? Vehicles? Jeeps are the only thing I ever drove. What kind of assignments did you have where you were using the jeeps? Recreation. For yourself, or officers, or other soldiers? Other soldiers, other seamen. Where, where would you go for this recreation? Oh, once went up into a snow uh, ski resort up in the mountain. Uh, we went to Rome. How was Rome? Was, was there much uh, uh, battle damage in Rome? No. Was that pretty, fairly pristine? Well, we stayed at a very nice, I'd like to tell you the name of the hotel that still exists and still very nice. Uh, stayed at a nice hotel. Uh, actually, it was in quite nice shape. We went to the Colosseum and I just, I, can, I bought some cameos from one of the guys down in the they're just hustling around, selling them. And my 
daughter just made him in this last year into hanging things. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, I had given them to my mother. Well, how long, how long were you in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Rome? Just, a, I, I think, about four days. Where did you stay in Rome? In one of the nicest hotels in Rome. All, all the time? <laughs> you were there all that and time? Still sitting at the top of the hill. I can't remember the name, though. But you were in that same hotel all, all the time you were in Rome? Yes. And who was paying for the room? All there of you chipping in? Service. Okay. How was the food? Good. All the food in Italy was good. Uh, what are some of the places that you were in the Mediterranean uh, on board ship? We went to Messina, which was the poorest place I have ever been in my life to see. The people were absolutely in need. Uh, I think we brought some supplies into them. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Palermo across the street. Some of the, Messina. Uh, they had a dry dock there that we didn't happen to use, but I think again we brought supplies down there. And we went through the straits and over into the Adriatic, but I cannot recall the port of coal. Uh, Lake Horn was the biggest one. We went over to um, a big island off the west coast of Italy. Sicily? Did you go to Sicily? No. Huh. Did you go, did you go to uh, Malta? <laughs> no, we did not. Oh my. Well, right up by Corsica. Were, were you always? Um, it would Cyprus? be south of Corsica. Were you, were, were you always on the same ship? Except the first month there, and then after that I was on the same ship, yes. Well, what, what are you doing when you're traveling around the Mediterranean? Are you pick, picking up materials or delivering materials or men? Delivering and, and uh, picking up materials. Where were you? Uh, on the west coast coast of Italy, we pulled off a half a ship that was on the ship. On, yeah, I don't know who got the other half, but we pulled it off. And I'm quite sure we brought that into Naples. So you pulled it, it off what, was a sandbar or was it on the beach or what? It where was on the beach. What kind of ship was it? Liberty. Uh, and that was a troop transport or a material transport ship? Yes. Where were you when you learned that uh, Germany had surrendered? I don't remember. You remember if you were on land or on, at, at sea? I can't answer it. Um, if you can't remember where you were, do you, do you remember any kind of a celebration with the fellas when uh, you learned that uh, Hitler had surrendered? I do not. When did, when did you leave the Mediterranean? <clears throat> In the spring of 1946. And we returned with the ship. Yeah. We went from the Mediterranean, we stopped at the Gibraltar, and then we went out and the roughest ride I've ever had in my life was going from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. It was absolutely like being in an elevator and dropping two floors. You just go up on a surf and boom, you'd go down and it would bang. It was a, it was an interesting trip. Did you have any problem with seasickness? 
I didn't <clears throat> personally. Did you take anything to uh, try to avoid that? Any medication or anything? No, I just was one of those fortunate people that didn't get seasick. L let me go back to Italy for a minute. Uh, did you have any uh, interaction with any Italian citizens? <clears throat> you see some Italians here in the hotel. Oh, interaction only as you know, them waiting on us, and I loved having their music while you ate, it was uh -huh. very nice. And I got a complete shave, haircut, everything you could get, I think, for $2. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how did the Italians uh, treat you? Very nice, <clears throat> very nice, very nice people. Good. They, uh, and the youngsters, so. Three, four, five, they, they learned English so fast that it's okay. just amazing. Could you talk to them? Yes. <clears throat> Frankly, all the youngsters. Were, were, uh, did they beg food from you? Beg yeah. food, and the, the adults begged cigarettes. Um. And we bought a carton of cigarettes for two dollars, and they were selling all over for twenty dollars. <laughs> so, uh, with with the kids, where where did you get your supply of candy to give the kids? Uh, uh, did, did you have to buy that uh, on shore, or did you have it on boat? We had it on the boat. <clears throat> we always had a lot of supplies. Uh, some of the people. Particularly in the in the gallery, would take sugar was a big item for them to take ashore and make a little extra money with it. Oh, so they would sell the sell the sugar. Did they sell the cigarettes? Oh, I don't know of anybody that didn't sell cigarettes that didn't smoke. And as <clears throat> as far as the candy for the kids, you just gave that away, didn't you? Yes. <clears throat> Did you have any inc incidents in uh, Rome that stand out in your mind at all? Are they getting a haircut uh, and a shave and... <clears throat> oh, I think going through St. Peter's and the foot of St. Peter's where people kiss the foot is just wore down from all the years of people just giving a slight kiss. Uh -huh. And the Sistine, how do you pronounce the chapel with all the paintings? The Sistine Chapel? Sistine, thank you. Yeah. yeah that was certainly... Well, you, back when we went through, you could go through the section that had all the jewels and gifts over the years, just tremendous gifts. That, after the war, when we were back as civilians, uh, was not available to be viewed. Hmm. Well, you, you, were raised, uh, you were raised a Catholic, right? Yes. Uh, and did you... Um, maintain uh, your Catholic uh, uh, upbringing when you were in the service? To the extent that we could. Did you have a chaplain on board ship? No, no. Uh, did they have chaplains uh, on shore that you went to any masses on shore? Yeah, we would find the local churches when we could. Okay. Um, so you were talking about the terrible, terrible trip back home when you left the Mediterranean and got into the Atlantic. How long did it take you to get home? I think it took us about eight days to get to Bermuda. And it's practically the only time we use sections in the training we use and they're really, a, they're tough to use as anything I know, maybe you know, when you use them to get location, you have to get the right time of day that you can see the horizon and you can see the star that you're using and then get that angle. Then you go to Bowditch and look it up and see where you're at. 
But in the Mediterranean, you could do most of it by dead reckoning. And at night, it was tricky, though, because there were no lights on, no navigation lights whatsoever. Uh -huh. um, and it was really on dark nights, it was... <laughs> It was touch and go, a, huh? It was not a good feeling because you were strictly dead reckoning. Well, what, what were your duties on board ship when you're returning to uh, uh, to Bermuda uh, from the Mediterranean? What were your duties on board? Third officer, 12 to 4. You just seven. keep it a lookout. Well, actually, you were in charge of the operation. You had a lookout and you had a man on the wheel. Well, we didn't, we didn't talk about the trip from the States going over to uh, Europe and, and uh, North Africa. How long did that trip take? I think it took about two weeks. During that period of I'm time? Half yeah. guessing on that. Okay. But it was a troop transport and we had a lot of college professors. We really had an interesting trip. They were in a civilian capacity. What was the name of it? Maybe Red Cross. But anyhow, uh, at night we would go out and they would teach us where the planets and we did a lot of night uh, learning. And now that's on the way yeah. over. Yes. Okay. It was, a, it was a very interesting trip, and by then, the danger of subs and all were really down. That's what I was going to ask you. By that time, uh, the the, uh, the Allies had pretty well had control of the sea as far as threats from submarines. Yes. Um, do you recall having any submarine warnings on the trip over to North Africa? None. All right. The only thing that, and I don't know how they ever got rid of them all, in the Mediterranean I had a map, we had a map on ship of all the minefields, and I would say the Mediterranean was covered with 70-80% of mines, uh, and they just did the shipping lanes, but we would run into mines. and. Uh, Fortunately, really? never hit one, and we never set one off. We had a 50 caliber up on the flying bridge, and we would sink them. But apparently, you have to hit the tip of one of those uh, mines of all these little spokes sticking out. Because, as I say, we've sunk a lot of mines, but we never set one off. So Theoretically, down at the bottom of the Mediterranean, there are active mines that never were set off? Probably. Wow. But I assume <clears throat> somebody must have picked up a lot of mines, too. Mm -hmm. Well, what'd you do when you got to Bermuda? Oh, we went, <laughs> we went to a tavern. <laughs> surprise, and, surprise. And, what was there? Ale was before we were on what two point three point or something. You got this higher alcohol, and <laughs> it was quite different. <laughs> How long were you in Bermuda? Two days. Then where did you go? What was your next port of call? Charleston, South Carolina. Yes. Uh, what were you? Uh, what were you doing between Bermuda and Charleston? Who was on board ship? Yes. Sa did you same have the same, same passengers? No, no passenger. <clears throat> Just take your two watches, two four-hour watches a day. But what were you carrying on board ship? Nothing. Nothing. Um, what did What did you do in Charleston? I think we got transportation right away and went back to New Orleans. Uh, by train, bus, air? I'm sorry to say I don't remember. Okay. 
uh, what was the USAT Tom Trainer T R E A N O R? What was that? That's the one <coughs> that I had mentioned. That was a merchant marine ship that I took waiting for my passage on the St. Mihiel. Uh, that's the one I had mentioned before going up to New York and back. And then I went on to the St. Mihiel. All right, and St. Mihiel is S-T period M-I-H-I-E-L. Yes. And that was, that was a larger ship than the Tom Trainer, wasn't it? Yes. And a ship that I was not qualified to serve as a acting on the on the bridge officer. I was a junior third officer, which uh, had minor responsibilities and a lot of learning possibilities. You spent all the time on your watch on the bridge. So you got to learn a lot on a large troop. It was a hospital ship, but was being used as a troop transport. We took Army families down to Cologne in the canal zone and uh, to join their husbands. And. Uh, I made the, the one trip, and I think I got back in August. Um, I would have stayed on that trip, and I would have had the opportunity to, but I, at that time, was making a choice whether to stay in the Merchant Marine and get a license or go home and go to college. And I opted for going home and going to college. Well, why, why were uh, servicemen uh, down uh, in the uh, uh, Panama area? I wasn't privileged to add information. But you're taking families down to see their... Uh, to join their husband. Yeah. The war was pretty much over yeah. and they were going to stay on duty. Was that just a down and back trip? You took the families down and then you immediately made a return trip? Yes. Where did that trip originate? New Orleans. New Orleans. How'd you like New Orleans back in those days? Did you get any time Wonderful. to spend? <laughs> spent a lot of time. <clears throat> it, was, it was a different place than it is today. Uh -huh. The French Quarter was just a... Uh, Nice place to go. You bring your family. It, it was One other. a great city. Today I had. I've been back once or twice, and I. <laughs> I, I wouldn't take a trip now. Well, early early in the war, there was a lot of German submarine activity in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, did uh, the United States or anybody mine the, uh, the, the Gulf? Did, were, there, were there any mines that you had to be mindful of? No. So right. you get back to uh, New Orleans, and how long were you there? You, you're close to getting out of the Merchant Marines, aren't you? Yes. And where were you yeah. when you got discharged? In New Orleans, um, and, and I went to uh, I went back to Dubuque, Iowa. How'd you get home? Train, bus, train. Was that a uh, civilian train or was that a military train? Civilian. Uh, do you know how long did it take you to get from New Orleans up to uh, Dubuque? Overnight. I can't say. Too long ago. <laughs> well, when you got when, when you got back to Dubuque, well, first of all, did your parents know you were coming back to Dubuque? They did. And where did they meet you? They met me at the train station. Yeah, I bet that was a good reunion. Uh, yes, indeed. At I, that time, he went to Chicago, and we had the 
the Burlington Zephyr was really a, went from Chicago over to Dubuque, and I think I've forgotten the time, but it's 190 miles, and it was a very fast train. Then it would go up the river to Minneapolis. Very popular train, always filled, well, very you economical. You, you mentioned the Denver Zephyr. My wife and I took the Denver Zephyr from Chicago out to Denver back in 1969, and uh, it was quite a nice experience. So what did you do when you got home? Uh, did you uh, enroll in college right away, or did you spend some... I enrolled in college right away, local college, Loris College. Was that a community uh, college, or was that four-year college? Four-year college. It used to be when my brother Bob finished there was Columbia College, and they changed it to Loris in honor of a bishop that had been in in charge. So in that, that, area. Was, that was a Catholic-sponsored uh, college? Yes. Quite a few priests, instructors, uh, a lot of civilians, so. What did you uh, enroll in? What were you looking for as far as a career? Business administration, pretty much up in the air. Uh, how long did you go? Two and a half almost three years and then my brother and I both at the same time transferred to the University of Iowa. Which brother? Chaz. Charles, the one that slew, flew the 51s. Did he get home before or after you? Was he already home when you got home? He was home already. Okay. What, what did he do before uh, both of you transferred to uh, University of Iowa. He went to Loris also. Okay. <clears throat> well, why did you transfer to uh, Iowa instead of staying at Loris? Uh, more prestige with a degree. So did you get your degree at I University of Iowa? Yes, Bachelor of Arts. What year was that? 1950. What did you do with that uh, degree? I went to work for GE Credit Corporation in Des Moines, Iowa. A new wall was... Doing what? That they were establishing. And there were one, two, three, four, five of us in the office. And it was interesting. I, we were working from eight in the morning till about nine at night every night get trying to get set up and everything and i was an hourly employee so i was getting about three four hours overtime every day so after about three weeks a letter comes from headquarters Mr. Becker's job is a 40-hour-a-week job, and that's what he'll be paid in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and I still worked every night, but no longer those fat checks. So you're, uh, you're working uh, 60 and 70 hours, but getting paid for 40? <laughs> yeah, oh. but huh? they were, it was a really good learning experience. Well, how long did you do that? Just for a year, I got reclassified by the service, and it was Korea time. And uh, so I wasn't going to get drafted and go into the Army, so I applied to the Coast Guard for a commission and was awarded a commission and went to the Coast Guard Academy. When did you, where did you apply to be in the Coast Guard? St. Louis, Missouri, <clears throat> to Captain Thomas. Nice guy. So your vision problem that kept you 4F uh, in the 40s, uh, did that uh, play any part in your becoming a uh, Coast Guardman? No, I just didn't want to <coughs> go in the Army. Okay. I just felt I had served in World War II. I, 
I didn't stay out of the army on my own accord for World War II, and I wasn't anxious to go in now. So I spent two years in the Coast Guard. Um, after you enlisted in the Coast Guard in St. Louis, where did you report? One of the guys I got to know very well had an automobile. He and another fellow, we drove up the Pennsylvania Turnpike and drove to Connecticut, New London, and uh, reported to the Coast Guard Academy. Just an absolutely great experience. New London, was that a submarine base? Crossed the, crossed the river. And then up, up a little ways was a Navy base, and they had a nice golf course, and we availed ourselves of that. <laughs> okay. So you're at, you're at New London. Uh, what was your rank uh, when you entered the Coast Guard? Ensign. Uh, did you get any promotions during the two years you were in the Coast Guard? Pretty much it. When we went into the reserve, we were all made Lieutenant JGs. And Lieutenant JG, for somebody that isn't familiar, what does that mean? Lieutenant the junior grade? Lieutenant JG is a full lieutenant in the Army. Ensign, Lieutenant JG, a senior, <coughs> excuse me, then there's a senior lieutenant, which would be comparable to a captain in the Army. Okay. Uh, but, but you were still, you were an ensign all the time, you were actively uh, with the Coast Guard? Yes. Did you always stay up there at New London? <coughs> We stayed at New London for four months, three months in the normal training, and I, we had set a wedding date for July 4th when my three months was over. And the Coast Guard decided we were going to go to atomic energy school. And there were about 45 in our class. I went to the executive office, officer and asked if I could get off for a long weekend for, to get married. And the answer was no. And uh, so Shirley's family had to send out corrections and we got married on the 28th. But the school was interesting. We went to a, whatever you call the thing that separates over in Long Island. But the school was so high end, there was probably four or five in the whole class that understood it. You'd have to almost be a science or a math ma major. The technical part of it was very technical. A lot of I saw a hundred pictures of the bombings and the results, and mm -hmm. it had its interest. But from an educational standpoint, it wasn't geared to most of us. Well, we you mentioned Shirley. When did you meet Shirley? <laughs> she used to stay at our house. She was a friend of my my sisters. So so you yeah. knew her when she was how old? Yeah, when I wasn't the least bit interested. Sure, but how, how old were you? How old were you when you met Shirley? I imagine eight, nine years old. Uh, but the only you, interest was after we both finished college. I was going to ask you if you had any interest in her during high school. You apparently didn't. No. Um, no. So, where did you meet her? Did you meet her in college? No, I met her one time downtown, in downtown Dubuque. Uh, she was with her mother and I saw her in a different light altogether. And well, we started dating and... Well, tell me about this all different, uh, this different light altogether. What, uh, 
What uh, drew your attention to Shirley when you saw her with her mother? She was very attractive. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, when I think back sometime, I really think it was kind of love at first sight. All because right. once I started going right shortly after we never didn't go together for four years. Mm -hmm. um, let, let me go back and clarify your college. That's, uh, was that St. Lawrence, L-O-R-A-S? L-O-R-A-S. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what was your wedding date? They wouldn't let you go when it was planned. What was the actual date of your wedding? July 28th, 1951. 1951. <laughs> uh, 71 years, the last one. Was she with you at all up in uh, New London? No, we were not married at that time. But you didn't see her at all? She didn't come visit? Did you have a chance to go visit her? Never left the academy. All the time we were there, no one came to visit. Okay. Did you uh, communicate by phone or mail? Mail a lot, uh -huh. phone some. <clears throat> How about when you were overseas? Uh, did you uh, communicate with your folks by mail? Yes. H how was the how was the mail when you were in service? Uh, was it delayed or was it fairly prompt? Or? My memory is it took about two weeks. Did you write home uh, very often? Not as often as I should. Was your, was your mail censored at all? No. Either coming in or going out, it wasn't censored? No. <coughs> so uh, you, you spend all of your time in, your, in the Coast Guard up at uh, Connecticut? When we were done with the four months, I went home, we got married. I was assigned to New Orleans. Oh, back to New Orleans again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we drove off after the marriage and stopped, and I had lots of friends from St. Louis, and they say, said, go to Oh, this very nice hotel, big, impressive driveway, and so we did. That was our special stop, and we went in, and we got in a room. The bathroom, you almost had to leave the door open to <laughs> sit on. It was terrible. It was a converted closet, and if we had been more mature or, or aggressive, we would have raised the devil. It was a terrible room. Uh -huh. And we were looking so, <laughs> looking forward to that. Oh, jeez. So we stopped all the way down, and we stopped at a motel, and the owners asked, you want to go to the car races? And we said, sure. So we went to the car races, and it was interesting. The next morning, we went over and said goodbye, and they said goodbye. Have a nice honeymoon, and we had never mentioned huh. <laughs> that he got married. So oh, I wonder what uh, gave him that idea. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so uh, you you go down to New Orleans, and where are your accommodations in New Orleans? We stayed <laughs> with. Uh, Shirley's uncle for a couple of nights, and then he had one of his colleagues come in. So we rented a place down on Canal Street, mm -hmm. a little small apartment. What was your duty I, there in New Orleans? <clears throat> I went on night duty on the Mississippi. We patrolled. It. And one night we had a storm, and it was quite severe and the lake 
Ponce train got messed up a lot, and we were on the river and hardly filled anything. So interesting. But that was the main thing. We just patrolled and we didn't spend a lot of time before we were waiting for our assignment to Camp Gordon in Georgia. Well, how long were you in New Orleans? I think about a month. What kind of ship were you patrolling in? Yes, that's what, the only duty I had. Well, what kind of a ship was it? It was just a 40-foot patrol boat. Inboard engine? Yes. How many crew? I think four or five. That was a 40-footer that the, if it rolled over, it would bring itself upright again. That was... What was your job during the patrol? Were you driving the boat or were you... No, just... Your own lookout? Watch out for <clears throat> activities that weren't proper. I so, think it was a fill-in time. Just a, just a something to do, John? <laughs> yeah, I think it was a busy work. So after you left, uh, after you left uh, New Orleans, you went to Georgia. Yes. What uh, what port? No port, right in Augusta, Georgia. Oh. At Camp Gordon. Camp Gordon. What did you do at Camp Gordon? As a went as to a, MP school. Very, very good school. It was very there training and use of the 45. We had training in uh, subduing people. We had actual in buildings set up so you really felt tense going in. Uh, it was they had a well well organized school. Well, was that something you volunteered for, or did they assign that to you? They assigned it, and it was it had a purpose. What was the purpose for you doing, learning that as a Coast Guardman? Our assignment for a number of us was out to Port Chicago, uh, California, and we were explosive loading officers. Uh, we there was a big loading dock. Usually we had two ships in, big ships, loading ammunition. In World War II, Port Chicago had an accident with ammunition, blew up the two ships that were there with the loss of about 500 lives. There was a port in Texas same thing happened about the same loss. There was one in New Jersey. One of that, either Texas or New Jersey is Port Amboy, I've forgotten. But there was three major explosion in explosive loading. And our duty was to calm this loading down and see that it was held a little bit orderly, not throwing, and so that's what we did. So what were you physically doing? Going aboard ship as they loaded and patrolled and correct and... Was that kind of a nerve-wracking job? <sighs> Knowing there had been three explosions? Uh, no, not really. I think they were... <laughs> I think they were quite careful. We didn't, I don't know as we were so effective, I think they just were more cognizant of the danger if you got too careless. So I didn't feel we served a great purpose. But well, you didn't have an explosion, did you? No, no. So you had a good purpose. <laughs> so they're lo you're loading this sh these ships. Uh, uh, they're, they're going over to Korea during the during the war over there. Yes, and we took the a we took the a bomb out one day. 
uh, and we had meetings beforehand and we had so many people. We were, I happened to be on the water patrolling, but they really had that thing guarded. The A-bomb was loaded aboard a ship. It went into the Pacific and there was a young seaman rode home and said, we have the A-bomb on our ship and he got court-martialed. Oh, really? That was big public news at the time. Uh -huh. So, now it's mentioning it is so fast, far past. The did, uh, did, did you transport the A-bomb out uh, into the Pacific? No, no. Did you know that it was going when it went? Yes. Did you help to load it on board ship? No, we just patrolled and seen that nobody got into the area. Okay. While it was being loaded. Okay. So how long were you there? Just a year. And then what happens? Discharged. Were you discharged from that same base? Yes. Uh, how did you receive your discharge notice? In person? By letter? By what? From our CEO. What did he tell you? Just handed me the document I have and said, John, your guys are going home. Here's a great CEO. Hell, a lot of good officers out there. So where did you go? You, you come back to Dubuque? Went back to Dubuque. How'd you get back? Plane or train? No, I rode with someone else. In the car? Uh, another family. Okay. How, how long did it take you to get from California back to Dubuque? About 10 days. Did you have stops along the way? Oh yeah, especially when the animals, <laughs> the bison blocked the road. <laughs> we were waited. It's oh, amazing really? how long you wait sometime for them to clear the road. What state were you in there? Probably Wyoming. Hmm. So when you get home, who greets you at home? My family. And then tell me what's going on then after that. You're finally discharged from both services and uh, you're, you've been through college. What did I you do? I applied and was accepted at the Maytag company. I applied for a marketing job and didn't get it. A uh, <laughs> good friend of mine did get it and went on up in Maytag. Uh, I went into their training program where you go into every division. And that, uh, that was in 1953? Yes. Uh, where was Maytag located? In Dubuque? Newton, Iowa. Newton? Newton. Newton, Iowa was Maytag. It's well, just where was Maytag. Newton in relation? Where was Newton in relation to uh, Dubuque? Uh, 130 miles. It was really close to Des Moines, Iowa. If we flew in from anywhere, when finally when I got out in the field, you'd just go to a cab and say, "I want to go to Maytag," and they were just. You just signed your name. If you were high enough up, you got in their airplane and flew. Um, I wasn't. Uh, so uh, Des Moines, Iowa was the main spot. Well, my wife and I have been out to the Amena colonies. Uh, were they a competitor of uh, Maytag? No, no, they were. They worked closely together. They eventually took their refrigerator and their freezer and put their name Maytag on it. And uh, so they had a joint venture together. Well, how long were you in training uh, with Maytag? Almost a year. Almost a year. So then what, did, then you, what did you do with the company? They sent me to uh, <coughs> Pittsburgh and I was what they call the 
service supervisor, we were all the parts distributor. We worked with them and made adjustments in all the parts and all gave them credit for all. The main job, though, was handling schools on the products uh, service, actually dismantling, showing them how it worked. Okay. And it was directed primarily towards the service people. Uh, and then troubleshooting. There was a dealer that had a problem he couldn't handle himself, whether it was in operating the uh, in mechanical, or at that time a big item was there was tons of bleach damage in automatic washers. Women were a lot more used to putting bleach in and mix it in the ringer washer, uh -huh. but they were pouring it in and it was just amazing how much bleach damage and we'd have to go explain and we had a light that showed just exactly where the bleach was uh -huh. and you could just put your finger through it and so that was I stayed for two years working in the field. And was Shirley with you? Yes, yes. So we where did you we lived in Prospect Park in Pittsburgh, nice area. Were you in a home, an apartment, or where? Apartment. Strictly many, many transients. Okay, from, from Pittsburgh uh, with Maytag, where did you go? I got to know some of the more successful dealers quite well and got very friendly with them. And talked to him a lot and decided I was going to, I had two options, either stay with Maytag and get a sales job in the field or go in business for myself. And we decided, uh, I looked at three different areas and my friend in Maytag sent me a market report on all three of them, and it was obvious that Erie offered the best opportunity. Erie, Pennsylvania? Yes. And uh, so I was acquainted with a widow up there whose husband had died five years earlier, and she was just going downhill in the business. So we made an offer to her, and we got a U-Haul and loaded up, and by then we had three children. <laughs> it was kind of, if, if we had been older and smarter, we never would have done it. Uh, <laughs> but we loaded up and we were in a store and we lived above it for eight years. And it was a touch and go <coughs> affair. You, you lived above the store? Yeah, uh, it's the only thing that saved us, and uh, we got to be in earring over. It took about ten years to really put things together, though. We got to be the second biggest laundry dealer by far in the city. Sears was the number one, and as they were all over the United States, they, uh -huh. were, they were powerful. They were very very effective. So, uh, in the process of running retail, I started putting washers and dryers in schools and apartment buildings, and that became very much more, it was more lucrative than retail. And I finally decided I went to Maytag and went to some people I knew well in, in the right positions and said I'd like to be a distributor. So I got to be the distributor up in Buffalo and parts of New York. Uh, and that broke us away from retail 
not <laughs> our, both our bank and our accountant kept saying, get out of retail and <laughs> spend all your time. But, but then I kind of liked the retail business. So we finally sold the, the retail business and uh, went into distributing of commercial equipment. Well, when, when you're in retail, did you always have the same location where you did business? No. <coughs> we, we built a store across the street. We, we bought an old house and we thought, oh, we're not ready to build. So we looked at the old house after Mrs. Brown moved out. We said, we can't rent this place. It was over a hundred years old. So we pushed up our plans, tore it down, and built a brand new building. Okay. How, and, how many employees did you have? <clears throat> when we got into distributor, we had 40. Well, when, when you're, when you're uh, in retail? We had about probably about 15. Okay. And uh, were, were you the owner of that uh, retail business? Yes. Uh, did your wife uh, Shirley help you at all in the business? In the early stages, yes. Okay. So then after doing that for about eight years, you decided uh, you were going to go in to be a distributor with, with Maytag. Right. And you moved from Erie up to Buffalo? We stayed in Erie turned our building into a commercial rental uh, where we got a couple of, uh, we, we rented out the whole building except a small space for my office. My son was old enough, I sent him to Buffalo to run Buffalo and we were very successful up there so successful we went down to Pittsburgh and got that distributorship and never did do very well there. So, but it... So when did you leave Maytag? When did you retire? <clears throat> 1995. All right, well, let, let's, let's talk about your kids. Uh, you've got uh, Susan. Was she Susan? your firstborn? Yes. Susan Marie Becker, and what's her last name now? Yes, John. She's always gone by Becker. Uh, but I'm sorry, I, I, you hit a dead spot. Okay. I'll think of it in a minute. Well, she married John, John. and Christian and well, she married, uh, she married John Cronin. Cronin, thank you. Okay. Well, it really isn't that hard. And Susan, Susan was born April 28th of 52, correct? Yes. Out in uh, uh, Vallejo, California. Right. V-A-L-L-E-J-O. And uh, she... she, she Mar Island. Pardon? Mare Island, Navy Base. Okay. And she married John Cronin in 43? Uh, he was born in 43? I, I don't. She married John Cronin, but he was born in March of 43? Yeah. Or that okay. one they I wouldn't have known. Okay. Uh, but they, uh, they got married in 84? In Boston? Yes. Okay, then... Uh, they had one child, Christian John. Yes. He was born April 27 of 89. Correct? Correct. Then you had an, another girl, Elizabeth. It starts with an L. It doesn't have an E in front of it. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. That's why we yep. went to the Ann, because everybody called her it's Elizabeth Ann. And everybody said Elizabeth, so we started calling her Ann. All right, and Out in Connecticut, they <clears throat> call her Elizabeth. Okay, and she married uh, Alan Scarfone. Yes. S C A R F O N E. Right. Uh, let's see. Susan's seventy, and Elizabeth is sixty-nine. Yes. Um, she was uh, Elizabeth was born July twenty-seven of fifty-three. What you got here in Dubuque? Okay. Yes. And they have two kids, Drew and Laura. Yes. 
Then you had another girl, Lisa. Lisa. Lisa Louise. Right. She's 67. Yes. And she was born on August 8th of 55, and she's born in Pittsburgh. Right. So you got these kids born all over the country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, then your fourth child was uh, Stephen Clark Becker. He was born in Erie. Right. <laughs> And he, he is 65, and he, he married Nancy. Her, her, her maiden name was Gurney, G-U-R-N-E-Y. Right. And uh, uh, they have three children, Brian, Matt, and Joey. <laughs> Those are all her children from her first marriage. Okay. Uh, her father, her husband, is deceased. Okay, sorry about that. But uh, uh, Stephen and Nancy are still married? Yes. Okay. Well, we're not finished yet. You've got uh, Mark John Becker. Right. And uh, he was born August 27 of 1960. Right. But fortunately, he was born in Erie also. Yeah. And uh, he, he married a, is, what was she? Was she uh, Korean? Was she... Uh, Chinese. Chinese. And she also was a widow with one child. All right. How do you pronounce that name? Do you know? <laughs> yes, I do. Any other time. Uh, oh. Saldan? Uh, Saldan. Thank you. And so it, dance, exactly. She's kept the Chinese name. A lot of Chinese young ladies have changed to a more American style name. But she's a, just a really nice. She was 39 when they got married, and Mark was 59, his first marriage. I don't know. <laughs> he just didn't. He went with a couple of gals, but they had a child right after they got married. All right. Well, let, lovely let, little girl, two years old now. Well, let, let me spell her name. It's X I O D A N, and she's her next name is Wang W A N G, and last name Becker. Then she came into the marriage with Luke. Right, who was uh, five years old. And now they have, uh, between them, they have Emily. Emily. <clears throat> and we're still not done. We've got uh, Julianne Becker. She's 54. She was an afterthought eight years later. Okay. Uh, I would make a joke of that, but I won't. Uh, yeah. born, born July 10th of 1968, also in Erie. Right. And you've got Richard Hammers. Did she marry Richard Hammers? That was her second marriage. The first marriage did not work out. Does, do, do she, did she have children from the first marriage? Yes, three. Uh, was her first husband's last name Nesbella? Yes, Nesbella. Uh, okay, she, had, she and uh, Mr. Nesbella had Riley, R-Y-L-E-Y. Right. And he was born March 3 of 1991. Correct? Correct. And they had another one, Callie, C-A-L-I-N, Nesbala, born April 6 of 93. Correct? Correct. And there's a Becker Nesbala, uh, but I don't have a date of uh, birth there. Do you know when... Becker was married, uh, born? No, <laughs> not exactly for dates. And then she and uh, Julie and Richard Hammers uh, had a son, Mason. Right. All right. Uh, <coughs> and <clears throat> so you had six children in all. Yes. And uh, Shirley's still living? Shirley's still living. Now, right upstairs. And we're, we're taking this interview at uh, 6,000 Riverside Drive 
in Dublin, Ohio. Uh, what is this facility we're, we're in? This is a retirement community. Very, really nice place to live. Uh, the employees are great. The, the food most of the time is good. And the facility the, name is what? Friendship Village? Friendship Village of Dublin. All right. And uh, with us uh, during this interview is another man that I am familiar with who is also a World War II veteran, Julian Smith. Uh, how long have you known Julian? I had known Julian almost from the time I moved in, and we moved in about a year and a half ago. I met him down in the training area. Down the training right. area? What are you training? Oh, <coughs> at, the, at that time we were doing the bikes, and I think Julian was getting uh, private instructions. Are you still doing, are you still working out? Every day, except the weekends. Good. Um, so, uh, how is your health doing uh, currently? <laughs> Bad question. Well, I, you, you're using it. No, no, I, I just went to the doctor and I've got something up in the air. But other okay. than that, I, I feel great. And <laughs> you're, you're able to motivate with a cane? Yes, and, yes. And, and, and I never use a cane in the house. I, I have, I take a lot of balance classes and I have a lot of balance classes here. Okay. Um, what, did you get any uh, medals or ribbons uh, dur during your uh, periods of service? I did not. <laughs> I don't say, I say that definitely, but not that I'm proud of the fact that it just didn't happen. I really was well, when you were in the Merchant Marines, uh, were you in the Merchant Marines, or were you in the Army, or the Navy, or was that Merchant Marine a separate branch? The Army Transport Service hired people from the Merchant Marine. So, in a sense, you took Merchant Marine, they had a lot of Merchant Marine people with license that served as skippers and all. People like myself served as non-licensed officers. And that was through the authority of the Army. All right. uh, if you were following the strict marine laws of the United States, we never could well, do that. There was a long time when they didn't even recognize the merchant mariners as a separate branch. Wasn't that right? Because poor, poor old Julian, he, uh, he had quite a time. Um, you know, we've been at this for a good while. Is there anything I haven't asked you about, John, that uh, you think relatives or friends might be interested in knowing about you that we haven't covered? I, I, the thing that I, I found interesting was the Coast Guard Academy was so impressive that we made a, a determination that we were going to visit every academy in the U.S. They are really a credit to the country. Uh, we've been to Annapolis, we've been to the Air Force Academy, we've been to uh, two years ago we went up to <coughs> the Army, West, Point. West Point, and it's just amazing what they mean to the country. They are impressive, and we were glad we got to visit them all. Well, I'm going to see if Mary can tune in on this uh, photograph. This is your class, graduating class? Yes. Graduating from where? i got to look which one. That one's from the Coast Guard. And there, I counted, there's 40 guys in your class. And uh, do, do you, 
have any reunions with any of your classmates from any of the schools you've been to, college or military? Nothing anymore. They're all deceased. They're close friends. I've got a photograph, but this, I think this copy might show up better. Hold it down. It's better. This is a picture of, John, this is a picture of four fellas. Yes. And if I remember right, you are the second one from the left. Yes. And who are those other three fellas? Close friends. And what, what uniform are you in there? Coast Guard. <clears throat> the one I think, there's one here of Bob, Pat, and the one with our um, memorial bench. I, th I forgot those. Mm -hmm. We'll get those. Yeah. Uh, Here's another group photo. That one's out of St. Pete. And uh, this is with the Merchant Mariners? This is the Army Transport yeah. Service. Okay. And it's taken in front of a Concord Hotel in St. Pete. Right. And if you look for the Concord Hotel, it isn't there anymore. Were you staying there? Yes. <clears throat> and we were, of course, I walked down a block to the Savoy to get all our meals. Well, the Savoy was pretty famous, wasn't it? Yeah. And the food was, for a while, absolutely awful. Now here's our Army hospital ship. This is the St. Mihail. That's the nicest ship I was ever assigned to. You see it? <laughs> and this other ship is an LT-222. What was that ship? That's a seagoing tug that I was on for almost a year. Right. That's the one you were in the uh, Mediterranean? Yes. <clears throat> all right. Uh, first of all, I'll show this photo of a bench, R.J. Becker. Mm -hmm. Where is that located? That's in Dubuque, Iowa, on Ham Island. I don't know where we caught the, <laughs> the name Ham Island. We used to have Dubuque Pack there. That was a huge business to, for Dubuque. And what, what, who uh, installed that uh, bench? Your family? I, I wasn't in Dubuque when my sister did all the arranging, collecting the money. Uh, I don't know who originated or who put it all together. There's a helicopter there mounted on a stand, and uh, there's many memorials for all the other vets in the From Dubuque area. Dubuque. Okay, and who is this? That looks like me. Hold it down, <laughs> Patrick. There you go. Mm -hmm. When was that taken? When was that taken? Probably about seven, eight years ago. Mary, is there anything uh, you, you uh, would like to ask John? Yes. How did you happen to come here? My, Julie, my youngest daughter, lived in Erie, lived about 
a mile from us, and it was our last contact in Erie. Her husband got transferred, not transferred, acquired a job down here. So they were leaving. We would be all alone up there. And we're, we are really fortunate. We now have my son, Mark, my daughter, Julie, my daughter, Lisa, just retired from in New York and has moved here. So we have three children. We have three grandchildren. So we have all the taxiing we need, the meals. It's really been a that We looked at three places. And I don't think either Shirley or I decided on this. Once our children visited and saw what this place had to order, to offer, they just insisted this is where we come. <laughs> and they were right. Well, thank this, you. Is, this is an outstanding facility. I, uh, Who's this a photo? Happy. Who is that a photo of? Don't recognize him. That's <laughs> me on a younger day. Uh -huh. That's nice. Yeah. Thank you. I can see why Shirley married you. <laughs> now we have a smaller photo here. I'll show you first. And this uh, is let me take what? a quick look. That's Leghorn. Yeah. That's the Leghorn, Italy. Yes. Where you were, where Ligornia, you were stationed. Leghornia, I think it's Leghornia in Italian. And that shows the damage, some of the damage that was done during the war. Yes. Who took that photo? I probably did. He's in here. Julian is here. Julian, is there anything you would like for me to ask uh, John? Yes, I have something real important. He mentioned that he, you did get the uh, new ribbons for the Mediterranean or the Atlantic, any ribbons, service ribbons? Did you hear that? He's saying you didn't get any service ribbons for the Mediterranean or the Atlantic. No. You did? Well, listen, I can help you. And there's one more thing. Did you get the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor? Did you, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, the government two years ago awarded the Merchant Marine, World War II Merchant Marine, a Congressional Medal of Honor. The fact that bank is very important. And did you, did you, do you, do you have knowledge of that, or did you get that? No, I did not. In okay, fact, you get that. Let me help you. I'm going to make it real short because you're close to lunchtime. We're going to miss lunch. Okay. Listen, here's, here's my point. Joe Pashano and uh, Susan Barr. Susan Barr is with the honor flight. And Susan Barr and Joe Pashano can help you. But you should have them. Oh, I'm not yet. You should have that Medal of Honor. Okay, well, I, well, can, I can guide you. I'm you uh, get that. We'll talk about that at lunch. Let me thank you for this interview and thank you for your service. And we're going to stop the interview and go to lunch. And we could talk with Julian about that. Yeah,